sponsored by securityinstitute.com. Bill's cogent technical and management expertise has delivered results to critical organizations in the world, gaining the trust of thousands of CIO and CISOs. Good morning, Bill Alderson here. How's everybody doing? Today is 9-2, September 2nd, 2021. Welcome to On The Wire Live, where we talk about packets. Packets on the wire, and we've been talking about packets on the wire with the On The Wire um, subscriptions and publications since 1989. Yeah, that's been a long time. I didn't just fall off the pumpkin truck. I've been looking at packets and analyzing systems for over 40 years. Started at Lockheed Missiles and Space Company with high security environments, connecting uh, IBM, Digital, Wang, and other systems between large government contractors with encryption gear in between. And I was the fair haired guy. Yeah, I used to have hair until I started working in networking. And then I had to start figuring out exactly what was wrong on the wire. And that's when I really had to learn everything. And it took a year and a half to get a top secret clearance at the time. So there was no way for us to bring in other people to do this. So we had to learn everything ourselves, do everything ourselves, analyze everything ourselves. There was no way to get anyone else to, to help. Um, so anyway, one second. Um, so, so anyway, what I thought we would do is go over the solar winds breach today. And uh, so, so here we are, we're taking a look at this report that I wrote and I'm gonna go through it. And you can take a look here and see, you know, that it was a supply chain attack and that sort of thing. And, and, uh, and so here, here we are trying to figure out what, you know, what was going on. And there's a little bit about me solving denial of service attacks against the stock market, led the Pentagon, uh, 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 communications restoral after 911, done a whole bunch of different things. So obviously I've been uh, doing this for a long time. Now, this, this, this session is based upon eight different series. Uh, anatomy of a massive breach. First of all, how did it all happen? Two, uh, that vital server um, internet updates were, um, you know, were being done on a server that was absolutely vital. And so, um, and then, you know, I talk about the four communications perspectives of a vital server, the, the five W's of who, what, when, where, and why, uh, and why you should know where your systems are communicating. Talk about the software improvement program. Was it an inside job vetting and exterminating entrenched criminals after a ransomware attack? Yes, you need to know uh, what's in there because they plant landmines that you're unaware of and then they boom, come to life, start sending packets and guess what? You can see those packets. The wire never lies. It doesn't lie. It's going to be there. And that's how we find things of that nature. And we do it with a lot of automation and, um, and, and very powerfully sift through millions of TCP and UDP sessions to find out what's going wrong. Now, and then who is at fault? I did a color-coded responsible party for each particular system. And, um, and then how uh, to prevent the any data breach really using data travel limits. Okay, so uh, part one, anatomy of a massive breach, the 11 evading steps. And here, here you go, um, you know, number one, uh, you know, you, you start looking through these different things and you can see who did what and when they did it. So the first thing is, is that we had 
a hacker who built a DLL. The DLL went over and got inserted in. Luckily, you know, I mean, this is this is more difficult um, to believe that there wasn't an inside job or some part of someone. How how does a hacker from the outside know exactly where the the solar winds coder keeps the files to be compiled in what subdirectory in what name and which drive you know it, it's just incredible I, I i have a hard time believing you know that there was not some inside job component to this particular hack and so they compiled them and when they compile them uh it ends up creating in that compiled code, essentially a signed set of, of, of signatures that all of that information is good. Okay, so then they put it out on the internet, which I am against as well. Uh, I don't believe you know critical systems should be updated directly from the internet and no system, workstation, server, I don't care what it is nothing should be automatically updated directly from the internet. And so I'll talk a little bit about that and, and why that was happening. And then the code, the first thing the code did was say, am I internet connected? Because woohoo, I just hit the jackpot. If these idiots left a mission critical server to have direct internet access, man, will I be lucky as a as a hacker, you know? And it's like that. That's essentially what happened. So the 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 fourth thing is is that the victim self installed all that code, and it it because it had internet access, it could exfiltrate out here to this Microsoft Azure server that then the server the server had access by the criminal and they took all those credentials and then they could simply log in to anything because their entire enterprise, every workstation, every desktop, every server, every router, every firewall was compromised at that point um, because of this. Okay, so let's continue on down. I'm gonna try and make this quick and go over the whole thing. You can get this on securityinstitute.com and I'll actually give it to you for free. If you go to securityinstitute.com, you'll see the ad there right on the front page. Click it and put in, uh, put it in the cart and then use the promo code of POC um, and boom, you're in. So then I talk about some other things, but those aren't the most important things. But the solar winds breach, you know, you need to know who your vital systems are talking to, who, what, when, where, why. So um, both on a, a micro basis and a macro basis. So that's basically that. Now the danger of internet updates. So the issue about internet updates, you know, um, without direct access, um, the, the hackers could not have pulled off the SolarWinds uh, attack. So here we are, the vital server you know, and we are air gapping it from the internet. And that's what I tell people to do. It, it's, it's essential. And for updates, Microsoft even gives a server and gives it away for free that you can use for, it's the only server that goes to the internet, gets all the updates. And then in, in back, um, those updates are, then the, the, all the devices on the network update directly to the, uh, the internal backup server. So you only have one server that goes to the internet, pulls all the updates down, and then hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of devices go and update internally to a server instead of allowing every single device on your network because you're lazy, let's face it, because you're lazy. You're lazy. You, you know, you're not a professional and you're lazy. You don't, you just want to let everybody go and everything be automatic. Well, that's why you get hacked because you are not professional. You are not a security expert and you are not doing your company good will by allowing every device on your network to automatically update from the internet. Just saying, I'm going to call it out. 
you can shoot me I'm the messenger but by God if I ever get a hold of your executive management they're gonna hear about it because that is why you're getting hacked <laughs> don't do it update locally inside not externally okay so let's continue on now the the solar winds Orion monitoring um, they sell a package for premises uh, routers, switches, servers, etc., and internet, internet systems, monitoring those, and cloud. And if you succumb to the uh, salesperson saying, "Oh, if you just put it all in one big package, it it, it will save you money," uh, well, did it really save them money? I don't think so. I think it cost them a pretty penny. So alternatively, you could still use Solar Winds. You could use that salesperson's product, but you're going to have to separate it out into different domains and have one for premises. So if they, ca if they compromise the premises, it's just the premises. If they compromise the internet, it's just the internet. And if they compromise your cloud monitoring, it's just the cloud. Alternatively, what most people do today is they have premises done um, a lot of times, you know, admittedly by SolarWinds. Um, internet done by some internet monitoring capability and vendor C is someone like Azure or uh, Azure resources or AWS and AWS resources or, or Oracle resources. So you monitor in the cloud with different systems and you monitor the internet and the premises. And then that way they're air gap. So you're not, you know, basically subject to what all these, you know, 18,000 people were because they did this. So um, the communications, um, you know, uh, uh, perspectives, here's a class A, a class B and a class C on the internet. Those are all red addresses from one to one uh, to 223. And then you have the special RFC 1918 addresses that you use on the inside of your organization. The 10 network, the 172.16 through uh, 31, the 192.168 um, network that we all use in, in our homes. Um, so anytime you have a green address talking to a red address, caution Will Robinson, caution. You need to be careful anytime red is talking to green or green is talking to red, per, much more than red to red or green to green. So there's just a, a level of, um, of concern there. So when we are looking at these different things, you know, there's some, some pictures that we can take a look at here. Here are the four security perspectives. What is coming into your organization through a firewall appropriately and getting inside your organization? What is coming from inside your organization and going out? And then what is your VPNs and your web servers and other public address systems, what are they communicating to on the internet? And then finally, what are your internal RFC, green to green, RFC, 1918 addresses, what are they communicating? Because a lot of times, if one of those get compromised by a fish or a ransomware, they start reaching out to people that they normally, it's called a fan out, and they don't normally fan out to all of those organizations. So consequently, we have things that we look at the number of sessions that, that you're looking at. Okay, so there's the four perspectives, and it's, it's pretty powerful, and, um, you know, you're wanting to make sure you're vetting all of these different systems. Okay, sorry, I did something wrong here. Let me go do this. And then I'll come over and do this and go down. I know you like the pictures and I try and make them big so you can see them on your phones. Okay, so vital server, you know, vetting those, those five W's. Who's talking to who? You know, who, who's communicating? through DNS, reverse DNS, autonomous system numbers, what ports, uh, what proxies, what are you sending, um, and when are you sending it, where are you sending it? Did you know that most hackers start looking at things on Friday afternoon when they get in, and then they really start going to town um, Friday night and Saturday, and it's usually Saturday afternoon that you start finding out that your files are decrypted. Why? Because 
everybody's off having a beer or they're at home. There's not as many people at the company. And I've even heard that some very popular uh, artificial intelligence uh, systems um, that, that take a lot of resources and send out a lot of uh, false positives, they tell um, customers to turn off the false positives from their artificial intelligence systems over the weekend because they don't have the staff to look at the, the SOC and the SIM to, um, to validate or corroborate those findings. So yeah, that's, that was a, a funny one. So here's an example uh, of how to understand your security research. Um, you've got uh, who, who's it talking to, how much data is being sent. Now you can get this with a packet analyzer, but it'll take you a month of Sundays to do it. So what, what um, Hob Zero's capability is, is to, to listen to the wire, but not capture the packets and then turn them into sessions and capture the hop counts and how much data is going. And then we calculate throughput and that sort of thing. And then we see who, who are you talking to? Um, and then we give you a map. Does anybody else give you a map of where a hacker just hacked one of your devices and what they're trying to break into as evidence? Do they? Do they? No. I don't care how much money you spent, they don't do this. And this is a unique capability that we patented. All right, so it's how to see where your data is traveling, the who, what, when, where, and why of packet analysis, of, of knowing where your stuff is. And so I give you all sorts of different um, reasons why this happened to people. And then also I talked about the software improvement program, an inside job. Was it an inside job? Well, you decide if it was an inside job. How did the attackers get intimate information about what drive letter, what file subsystem, what directory name? I mean, really? And then to get them to, to put all that in. I believe that there was some inside job considerations because these are some things that are impossible to know. Um, unless there was inside information. So um, talk a little bit about that. Okay, so then finally, um, when, when we're talking uh, about who could have helped them with this hack, it was, do you know that it wasn't even the uh, software, uh, Orion monitoring software updates that got them all hacked? It was because they clicked the box, yes, I'll participate in a software improvement program. And so they clicked on that box and then that installed software on there and that software was getting updated and that's how the SolarWinds breach what entered into all of these organizations because they participated in the software improvement program. So somebody who, to pull off this hack had to know about the software improvement program, had to know about SolarWinds and, what, and their internal processes. And then they also had to know about the Microsoft security and systems around this. So you put down in the middle of that, right in the middle of that uh, triangle is the person who was most likely, um, you know, trying to help them or did help them or a combination of all of those three. Somewhere along the line, the hackers got help to do this um, SolarWinds breach. Okay. so. How do you vet and exterminate after the hackers have gotten in here? See, this is one of the things, this is one of the things that I told everyone when I wrote this report, be careful because once hackers get, get into your system, they can do whatever they want. They can leave landmines and they did exactly like I said. And those landmines come to life later on. And how do they come to life? They send a packet. They send a packet on the wire. And usually they're sending it to somewhere. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So those are Trojans that they place in there. You need a system that watches for those Trojans to come alive and then start communicating on the wire. Did you know that if a hacker gets into one of your servers and the first thing they do is expunge their own behavior, their own activity out of the logs so that things like Splunk that you spent, you know, 1 million, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million dollars on are now ineffective at helping you solve that problem because 
they turned off the feed to Splunk with those that logging information. Yes, it's true. It's true. It's true. And that can happen. And so these embedded criminals are very smart. And so you need tools that watch for this continuously. There was a lot of consternation about you know, uh, Chinese equipment, having systems that would start communicating for, on their own. Could be true. Could be true. How do you know it? How do you know when those systems start communicating if you're not watching for them? If you're not watching the five W's, who, what, when, where, why? If you're not watching it, those systems can, in fact, start working to infect your other devices and then to reach out and allow them to come in and take control of your system even more. Do you see what I'm getting at? These, these are, to me, with 40 years of experience, absolutely elementary. But talk to some of your highfalutin vendors or your you know people, and it's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, we need to spend all this money on this, that, or the other thing, and it's underwater basket weaving or artificial intelligence systems that are gonna, you know, give you so many false positives. You're gonna have to have a support desk area that's so large because you have to hire so many people that you can see the curvature of the earth in their cubicle area. Yeah, it's that bad. So yeah, anyone can do minutia analysis. Anyone can cause you to have to go through and do massive hiring for massive amounts of information and then never come up with solving the problem or finding or rooting out those things. You need well-designed tools operated by experts, but it doesn't have to be an army. It can be a small group. Okay, so um, you can watch for these bulk sessions. You can look for TCP session indicators of fa failed connections. Those are, are signs of what's to come, signs of about getting there. Okay, and then I showed you, you need to have signs and you need to see where things are inside your company. And so that's 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 what we're doing here. We're showing you where your your communications are coming from and where they're going to. It's pretty cool. All right, now, um, and then you can vet. You know, why are you allowing this particular thing, this particular Azure host? Do you want to allow it or not allow it? Well, no. If if you're watching it, you're you're going to come up and say, no, I'm not going to allow my Solar Winds. A monitoring system to reach the internet by default on anything it wants to communicate with. No, I'm not. Okay, so who's responsible for the solar wind? So let me just show you this real quick. Um, here you've got, you know, color code with with orange with that's I believe, my opinion, is the responsibility of solar winds. Solar winds allowed this. Now the criminal was the catalyst who built the DLL, but SolarWinds is the one who allowed them to get in and, and put their files in. And then they were the ones who compiled it and signed it as a good um, in, uh, deliverable. Then they're the ones who put it out on the internet for unwary victim, their customers, to install on their servers. And then their servers had access to the internet and started exfiltrating. So four and uh, four, nine, uh, four, nine, and 11 are the fault of the victim. You know, just poor, poor systemization, poor authentication, poor, just poor management caused this. And, and we blame these omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent hackers for this. Bull, you left your door wide open and you got your asses handed to you. Admit it. Stop telling Congress and everyone else, the hackers are so powerful. Malarkey, they are not. They're not very smart, frankly. And you can stop them if you employ good hygiene and good methods of management. It makes me mad because you're all duped by people who say they're security experts and they don't even understand how packets work. Oh, it's pitiful. 
If you have people working for you and they do not know packets, they are not security experts because that is the foundation. The foundation of all security is knowing every field and every packet and every discriminating thing that you can allow to deny it or to allow it. And that is the fundamental basis of security. And I don't care if you're if you're doing other parts of security like virus scanning, if you call yourself a security expert and you don't understand packets, hey, guess what? I can either be your best friend or your worst enemy. Learn packet analysis if you are a security expert. Learn it. You can learn it in a week or so by just sniffing yourself, by downloading uh, Wireshark and analyzing some packets and getting familiar with how you do these things, okay? It's just not rocket science. And you have no excuse. You've been out here doing this for, you know, how many years now? And just because you rub shoulders, you go into the data center and you, and you like an old cow, you rub up against and you scratch your back with firewalls and security equipment. And you buy stuff, you click to install it, you plug it in, and you call yourself a security expert. Not until you've looked at the packets can you truly say that in my book. Now, you can say whatever you want in your book, Mr. Executive, I don't care. But I'll tell you what, until you get people who start knowing how to look at packets and start discriminating on packets and understanding what the heck is going on. And the higher up the food chain it goes, the more you get President Trump and President Biden to write stuff out there and to make all these edicts and it's malarkey. The higher it goes, the worse it gets because there's total technical incompetence. These people can't even can't even work their own phone or their own computer. Their executives can't even do it. And yet we are listening to them about what to do about our cyber problem. Baloney, just give us some money and hire people who know shit and it'll be better. Okay, all right. So finally, now how can you stop all this? Well, I'll tell you how you can stop it and you can stop it with uh, travel limits. And so what we do is we learn what your vital systems are, and then we neuter their ability to communicate at the basic system. No software, it becomes an endpoint system that absolutely stops it from communicating more than three routers. Keep it in the data center, keep it in the company, keep it in the organization. It really is that simple, folks, and I can help you understand all these things and you can figure it out so that when somebody comes in and gets into one of your users, fish is a workstation, the fish tries to break into your database, your vital server, the vital server cannot consummate the TCP or UDP session, it stops the compromise and at that point we alarm and boom, hook them, cook them and fry them up in the pan. That's what we do with ransomware and that's what we do with fish. And if you don't believe it, give it a try. I mean, what have you got to lose? What do you have to lose to try something new that Cisco, Fortinet, Checkpoint, and Palo Alto Networks, not one of them have? And why would they not be talking about hop starvation? Because they don't have it. So why do I have it and they don't? I've been working 40 years before most of them were a gleam in their father's eyes. And I started looking at packets and the government came to me and said, Bill, what can we do about all of these people from around the world attacking our systems? And I said, you can use hop starvation. And then I built a hop starvation management system and patented it. So that's where we are today. I'm Bill Alderson. We talk about on the wire. We are definitive. We are confident. We're not con men. We know what we're doing. We, we look at the packets to determine what's going on. And then we help you understand what's going on, who, what, when, where, why, and help you eradicate those guys. So don't keep doing this over and over and over again. 
Let's get smart. Let's do it right. Bill Alderson and On The Wire. We'll see you tomorrow. Join network security pioneer Bill Alderson as he brings On The Wire content live. Sponsored by securityinstitute.com. Bill's cogent technical and management.